Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is another chilling thrill ride adventure from the wonderful mind of Michael G. Lockhart. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? If you haven't already, I do recommend that you go watch the poor scene horror that I covered about a month or two ago from Michael was the first story of his that I covered. And it's definitely gone down as one of my personal favourites this year. And this is the first part in a spin-off series to that incredible piece. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled... Bloody Bones and Green Eyes. Let's get straight into that. Samuel L. Clinton, Sam C. to his associates and customers alike, tramped down the trail that led to the driveway of the Travis Broxton family. That would in turn lead to the Farm to Market Road, 1988, and from there to his friend Wahoo's house, where he'd left his car. It was a long walk after dark, but worth it. The Broxton's extended family was in town. Some of them had decent money and had been willing to part with it in exchange for some first-class blends of a certain THC producing plant. He and Wahoo had worked on the blend for years, and it was infamous in the area. He, of course, was stoned out of his gourd. Hey, he had to party with his subordinates and yokels to get them fired up to buy all that it had brought. He managed to collect $250 profit from the relatives and was feeling satisfied. They'd even fed him and one of the two of the girls had shown some interest in slumming with him. He'd definitely be back tomorrow night. As he wove his way through the brush, he thought he heard a noise or noises. Not loud, but all the other night sounds had stopped. He looked around and saw nothing but shadows under the bright moonlight. He was about to cross a small clearing full of goatweed plants and grass. He'd have to stay on this path to avoid the bull nettles. Those things hurt like fire, and he'd have to piss on the affected area to get rid of the sting. Or so he'd been told as a child and swore by it. His mind was still foggy and wandered. He rushed back to the present when he saw a large shadow move, and then a head stared at him from out of the tangle beneath the trees. Large green eyes gazed at his own eyes and held him transfixed, and then they blinked. It broke the spell and he picked up his pace. It couldn't be more than 200 yards to the driveway. He remembered this track, he recalled the clearing. Once he had made it to the road, he'd be safe. And he stumbled along, his high rapidly fading along with his remaining physical coordination. His fear morphed into panic when the eyes appeared in front of him and he heard the rush of a large body and a roaring scream. His hind brain, a feature left over from generations of evolution, knew that sound as had his primitive ancestors. It caused the release of all bodily functions that were not critical for survival. It didn't matter. The mess in his britches was the least of his worries. Sam C. was on the ground and dying before he could let out a scream of his own the result of which was a feeble, mewing sound, and all that he could manage. Uncle Jim spoke in his low, raspy voice to the enthralled family members and friends, especially the children who encircled him around the bright campfire. He had just finished telling a tale that ended with bloody bones and green eyes which elicited some intakes of breath and squills of not quite fear, yet the little ones clamoured for more. And so, supported by the adults who had always loved his campfire stories, he sat back for a moment, scratched his beard and pretended to think. Hmm, well now, this one ain't all that scary, but you might like it, since it happened to me and happens to be true. When I was a young'un, the old folks shared all kinds of strange stories, and many of them featured cats, especially black cats. At this he leaned forward and raised his eyebrows, and bugged his eyes to the delight 
of his audience. I was walking, well, to be honest, stumbling drunkly, back home from Maiden's Beer Joint near Black Cat Ridge. They called it an ice house. I guess that sounded better to some folks. Tiny little place. They always had fresh catfish heads mounted by the door. Don't know why made the place stink. Maybe they wanted people to throw up so they'd have to buy more booze. He waited as the crowd made a bath noises and cheered him on. And well, that night, I had a good long taste of Le Fouvre's folly, local moonshine, and so I was in a merry mood and enjoying my moonlight stagger. There was a really bright full moon that night too, made for spooky silver shadows, especially along the little dirt road that wound through the willows covered in drooping Spanish moss. I jumped, he said, the last with emphasis, and raised his hands in grasping fingers. Uncle Jim's stories weren't always scary, but his behavior, as he told them, invariably was. When I heard a loud and deep hoot, 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 well, it was just an owl, but in the dark and by myself like that, it sure scared me. My first thought was, ghost. I heard a woman scream off in the distance. I knew better though, that was a cougar. Good thing though. I wasn't far away, and if it was prowling, chances were that the other big critters and book of bears would hunt elsewhere. As I walked up to the little bridge over Ben's branch, though, I got a funny feeling, a sort of chill down my spine, like a spook was nearby. Hardly anybody used this old dirt road and wooden bridge anymore. It was scary, even in the daylight. As I was about to step out onto the feeble old bridge, I saw a figure in front of me. It sat right in the middle of the bridge. It was a big old black cat. Not a panther or a cougar, mind you. Plenty of stories about them big ones, but big. Maybe like old Melvin, my black lab. It had huge green, glowing eyes, and the moonlight made the whole thing kind of shimmer and shine. It blinked its eyes at me, and then, no kidding, it spoke. He went quiet and waited for it, and true to form, one of the younger children asked, What did it say, Uncle Jim? It said, Follow me, my darling, in a voice like that of an old woman, and then it swirled away and jumped off that bridge. Now Ben's branch was swollen, and it was springtime and rainy, so anywhere that the cat would have landed would have caused a splash. But I never heard one nor saw it neither. Now I knew that cats weren't supposed to speak, at least not in human talk, and so I up and decided to walk the main road. I just had to suffer the extra distance and risk the laws catching me drunk and taking me to jail for the night. Now a talking cat ain't all that spooky, but the next day I found out that that old bridge had finally given up and fallen into the branch that night. If I'd walked out on it, well, I wouldn't be here telling tales. And the moral to that one is, the black cats don't always mean bad luck. Sometimes, they're just a warning. Well, there was a general applause, and Uncle Jim excused himself as another family member brought out a fiddle, and others brought out various instruments and began an impromptu concert. And one of the older boys, mid-teens, approached Jim as he left the campfire circle. And TJ, Travis Jr., saddled up to his great-uncle. He didn't say anything, he just walked alongside the elderly man. And Jim stepped out of the circle of light from the fire and started to urinate. The act no longer held any embarrassment for him since he was pushing 80. TJ shrugged and then emulated his older relative. And Jim didn't mind. He worried some for the boy who'd lost his father last year. Natural for him to cling to an elder man in the family and with his dad, poor Travis Sr., gone. Awful ending getting eaten by a sounder of saber-toothed hogs. Jim realized that if he was going to figure out what the boy wanted, he'd have to ask. So, TJ, how are you and your ma and sis doing? TJ shrugged. All right, I guess. It's been hard on ma, though, having to work while Cassie and I go to school. I turn 16 soon, so I can get a regular job and I can help her. I've been helping with the farm work and up jobs when I can get them. He trailed off, 
Clearly he wanted to ask something, and so it was Jim's turn to wait. Uncle Jim, I looked into Black Cat Ridge. What you said about the moonshine? Jim cackled a little. <laughs> yep. Homemade corn liquor. Repulsive stuff. Stunts your growth. TJ looked down, clearly in thought, then looked up a little startled. Oh, uh, I didn't want any. I was just thinking about the people who'd been there for a while. Dad didn't talk about it until just before he went down to help with the feral hog problem. He said the place could be nasty, with the swamps around it and even more with the people who live nearby. It was hard, but I found out everything I could about what happened to him. I'm proud of him for trying to help. Jim patted his shoulder. Well, TJ, I'm sure proud that you know how to research. For all that he played the hillbilly, your dad was a bookworm when no one was watching. He laughed a little at the fond memories of Travis Sr. Now how about we get back to the others and scrounge up some grub? TJ nodded and smiled. He'd found the approval he'd needed, and since he was 15, food always interested him. The rest of the family packed up the next day. It was Labor Day weekend, and most of them had to be in work or school on Tuesday. There were many hugs and handshakes, and promises of, We'll talk to y'all soon. And TJ and his little sister Cassie watched as Uncle Jim, the last to leave, started to pile into his old pickup truck. Uncle Jim, thank you for all the stories. It sure was good to see you, TJ said a little shyly. The old man grinned his yellow teeth contrasting with his white beard as he stretched out his hand for a manly shake. TJ, I'm glad to see you growing into a man like your dad. He was my favorite nephew, even though he was the youngest. Nobody can miss him more as much as you and your sister do, not even your mother. Well, in a different way. Y'all keep looking out for one another, and if you need anything, you just holler. Oh, and don't go looking for wild hogs outside of the intranet. The children assured him that they would not, and Cassie gave him a big arms around his waist hug. He climbed up into the cabin with soon a receding plume of dust as he headed down the dirt road that led to their home. The gatherings had been held here at the old farmstead property since Jim was a boy. The property had been in the family for longer than that. It was still pretty far from anything, just a small gas station town. They now had an off-brand dollar-something store that was somewhere between a grocery and a convenience store, and what the old-timers called a, a whatnot store. And they had a feed, seed, and hardware all in one. That wide spot in the road was six miles from their place, and the nearest town of any size was 30 miles. TJ gave his little sister a playful and very gentle shove. You ready for school? Gonna be a freshman? A, a fresh woman, that is? He grinned at the last. Cassie rolled her eyes. Oh, yes, how about you? You'll be a senior, mister, one year ahead of everybody else, soon to be employed. Hot snot. TJ's grin widened. Ready as ever. I really want to get done with high school. He trailed off as they approached the front porch. Hey, I'll be back in a little while. I want to walk down to the pond and clean up some of the mess the cousins made before it rains. Tell Ma I'll be back in soon. I will take care of cleaning up outside the house. Cassie nodded. Okay, you going to take your gun? TJ shrugged. Nah, I got my big knife and it's just a little walk. Not staying long and with all the people we've had running around... Nothing will be lurking at the pond. Besides you, she stuck out her tongue and then dashed inside the house. They were lucky to have one another these days. It had been almost a year since their father had died. He'd gone to help hunt down some saber-toothed hogs and had become one of the heroic figures to perish under the teeth and hooves of those monsters. The sheriff down there had sent him a photo of the head of a beast that was now mounted in his office, and there was a plaque beside it that read, Pig, Pride, Integrity, and Guts, dedicated to those who went forth to serve and gave their all. He hardly considered it a prized possession, but he understood that that man had meant well. 
His mother had almost vomited when she'd seen the photo on his screen. That thing had killed and eaten her husband, the father of her children, the love of her life. TJ made it to the large pond and began to make his way around it. No doubt some of his idiot cousins had sneaked beer or dope out into the woods and had left a litter around the pond. And sure enough, in the clearing around their old fort were several empty beer bottles and a few butts from cigarettes and blunts. He left a trash bag tied to a nearby tree, but none of the refuse had made it inside. He gathered it all and set down the bag. He really wanted a few minutes to himself. He skimmed a few rocks across the otherwise still surface of the old cow pond as he processed the concerns of his life. And then he noted an odour. Oh, something foul. Not overwhelming, but fresh. The odour of a recent death. Uh, Travis Sr. had raised his son to hunt and track and to pay attention to the woods around him when they were outdoors. The coppery scent of blood, the foul stench of open viscera, and the gamey smell of a dead mammal caught his attention. He paused to check the wind direction, and then started walking upwind in search of the source of the stink. He found the general area from which the scent had originated, but saw no carcass, until he looked up. In the crook of a tree was lodged a body, not a deer or a hog as he expected. This mass of necrotic flesh and clothing had been a person. He recognised only the bloodied jeans as clothing, and the rest of the remains were mangled and stained with dried bodily fluids. He backed away slowly from the tree. He looked all around to ensure that the predator was no longer nearby. He knew better than to run, but it took every ounce of his self-discipline to keep his feet moving at a moderate pace. At the pond, he paused to pick up the trash bag, and then increased his pace back towards home. Along the way, he was sure that something had tracked him. No, paced him. He caught glimpses of dark sheens out among the shadows and trunks of the pines that surrounded the area. At one point, he would have sworn he'd seen a pair of eyes flash at him. Large, green eyes. The figure was lost from view as a small tree with leprous bark obscured it for a moment. And then it was... gone. The feeling of being stalked evaporated, and TJ hurried in earnest, not quite running, to his home. He hadn't wanted to tell his mother, but he had to. She handled it better than he had feared, though he had hated to cause her more grief. She got off the phone and the sheriff's office soon had a deputy on the way. After a few more calls, everyone who attended the gathering was accounted for, so at least no one from the family had been harmed. The big deputy arrived and TJ took him out to the site. This time he carried his rifle and the bowie knife his dad had given him for his 13th birthday. It was late afternoon, but they had plenty of sunlight left. When they arrived at a death tree, TJ remained alert and looked for his erstwhile stalker. And then he noticed that the tree was empty. And there was still gore on it, and it still reeked of mortal remains. I know this is the right tree. You can see the blood. He gaped in confusion. The deputy eyed him suspiciously. He looked askance at the boy when he insisted on being armed, despite being in the presence of an armed deputy. The kid and his mother had cajoled him into digging into the trunk of his car and taking along his issued AR. Now, TJ, corpses don't get up and leave. You know this area, no doubt. And what you reported is very serious. We can't have people calling and wasting our time. What kind of game are you playing? You've never been a problem, kid. TJ just looked astonished. Is this dude blind or just lazy? He had to ask himself. I'm sure. Let's please just take a look. I know what I saw, and my dad taught me not to lie, especially to the laws. His dad had also taught him tracking, and in shadowy light of a late afternoon, under the canopy of the piney woods, he circled the tree in search of signs. Well, there wasn't much to be seen among the leaves and pine straws, but... There. That's where something dragged him out of the tree and into the deeper woods. You can still see the blood and other stuff on the tree bark. Deputy Briscoe looked, but was clearly unconvinced. 
Well, it's just some leaves moved around, and yeah, that looks and smells like blood. Something sure stinks, but how do I know that that's human blood? Without some proof, we don't need to be wasting time out here traipsing through the brush. Without a body, we won't have any evidence. TJ found himself again looking astonished. So, you aren't going to go and do anything? Maybe take some samples or photos? The deputy rolled his eyes. I'll get the evidence tech to come out tomorrow and get a sample. In the meantime, let's get you back home. Y'all stay out of the woods until we can get back in good daylight. TJ quickly snapped a few photos on his phone and accompanied Briscoe back to the house in sullen silence. Travis Sr. had never held much faith in the local constabulary, and TJ was picking up the same attitude. He griped to his mother and sister for a while before they had supper, but it was really nothing else to do. They all settled in and prepared for a big first day of school. Hopefully, Deputy Briscoe could find his way back to the tree with the evidence tech. TJ's hopes were dashed at about 4am the next morning. It started to rain, and then it started to pour. The water was still coming down in buckets when he and his sister boarded the school bus. His heart sank as he plopped into his seat. He had a rain slicker and umbrella, so only his shoes and cuffs of his trousers were wet, or soaked, he thought glumly. No way the sheriff's office would. Okay, or to be fair, could send anyone out to gather blood that would no longer be there. This wasn't some TV program where crime scene techs would bring out a mobile lab and have the mystery solved in less than an hour. He was right. His mother sent him a text to tell him that Deputy Briscoe had called to cancel and that they would try again when the rain let up, likely tomorrow afternoon. All that day, he was distracted. He barely spoke with any of his friends, just brooded in corners during breaks, all the while trying to puzzle out who the victim could have been and what exactly had killed him. He had no answers. There had once been black bears in the area, but no one had seen one for years. Cougars were back, but they just weren't all that big and still very rare. Maybe a booger of some kind. His dad had told him that those were just stories, but that he shouldn't disrespect people who thought that they saw such things. A mixed message. One party was unwilling to let him sulk, his best friend, Will. Will's dad, Billy, had been Travis Sr.'s best friend since childhood and had perished along with Travis Sr., the men had hung out together, and so naturally did TJ and Will. Will was a year younger than TJ, who was the older man of their group, along with Cassie's best friend Natalie, who had a definite crush on TJ. And they were normally a tight-knit group, and TJ was annoyed when the trio joined him at a lunch table, and Will started it first. So, no idea who the body was? TJ looked up, not at Will, but at Cassie, and glowered. You know you weren't supposed to say anything. It could mess up the investigation. Cassie just rolled her eyes. Seriously? Because old fat Briscoe says? Will and Natalie are our best friends. If we can't trust them, who can we trust? TJ pursed his lips and sat back, clearly determined to be stubborn. Natalie placed her hand on his and said softly, Travis. And she's always called him by his name, which she secretly liked. You know that none of us would tell anybody outside of our circle. We want to help, to be there for you. We believe you. Oh, those eyes. Like some cartoon Disney princess, TJ thought. He considered for a moment more, and then shrugged. Ah, you get it out of me sooner or later. I have no idea. We accounted for everyone at the gathering. So it's either someone local or someone passing through or someone who's been brought in and killed. Maybe killed and brought in, but there was sure a lot of fresh blood and other stuff. He swallowed the bile that rose at the memory of the odour and he shivered. I figured that I'd ask Briscoe or one of the other deputies if anyone was missing. The chances are that he didn't check because he didn't really believe me. He just knows that Sheriff Green will kick his ass if he doesn't do his job, in at least a half-assed way. Will sniggered. Yeah, old Briscoe is lazy and dull, but not so stupid as to get caught being lazy and dull. You think it was anyone we know? And TJ shrugged. Well, that's the half-a-million-dollar question. The other half-a-million is, 
what actually happened to that person. They spoke on until lunch was over, and by the end of the day, TJ was actually tired from the stress of thinking about it, trying to solve a puzzle without all the pieces. He went to bed early and had disturbing dreams. Well, he was out in the woods again, and his stalker was back. Well, it was dark this time, and all he could see was a large shadow skulking inside the tree line as it paced him. He tried to go faster, but the shadow shape kept pace. He decided to make a stand, and so he stopped and turned towards the source of his nightmare. And from within the shadows emerged a large, gleaming, glowing green eyes. The eyes blazed into his soul, and he shuddered as they grew closer and larger. And as they came upon him, he felt the hot breath of a large creature. He heard a scream in the distance. It sounded like a woman's scream, like his mother, or sister, or Natalie. Yes, it was Natalie, with her own big eyes, screaming in the night. And then he was awake and breathing heavily, the nightmare images fading into the warm darkness of his room. And he was startled as the scream became reality. And he could hear, out in the woods, a woman scream. He scrambled out of bed and into the jeans he'd laid out for school. He slipped on his boots and looked up, startled, as his door crashed open. It was Cassie. She held her little two two three rifle. TJ picked up his old three oh eight and set it on the bed. Did you hear that? She shook with fear and anxiety. What the fu she trowed off when their mother appeared carrying TJ's old twenty gauge. I heard that, Cassie. We'll worry about it later. Did y'all hear that scream? TJ rolled his eyes and raised his voice. If there is anyone else in the house, yes. Everybody in the house heard that. The last bit of grumbling was distorted by the t-shirt he pulled over his head. Cassie, will you spotlight for me? Mum, I need you to cover me. It sounded like it came from the back of the house, so let's start on the back porch. He snatched his rifle from the bed and checked the load as they trundled downstairs. He opened the door cautiously and shined his small but very bright light out into the darkness towards the woods. Nothing. He stepped out, Cassie closely crowding his heels with one of their father's big handheld spotlights. Once he was in position on the porch and the rest of the team flanked him, Cassie turned on the spotlight and shined it into the trees. Just shadows. Either of you see anything? He asked without taking his eyes off the branches and brush shrouded in the darkness. And Cassie spoke first. No, I think that it's someone out in the woods, some... At that, she was then interrupted by another scream, and this time followed closely by a yowl of some creature in pain, maybe closer to the house. They stood for a while, but no more sounds burst from the woods. The rain started again, light this time, but steady and they gave up their vigil to try and get some sleep, much closer to the house. They stood for a while, but no more sounds burst from the woods. The rain started again, light this time, but steady, and they gave up their vigil to try and get some sleep. Something was definitely haunting the woods. Terry Ann ushered her brood inside and sent them back upstairs, and needless to say, firearms would be kept close, and it was unlikely that anyone would sleep for a while, if at all. Wahoo shook and cowered as Lil Luther loomed over him, taking up an inordinate amount of space in his tiny, filthy living room. Lil Luther, who was not Lil at all, stood with fists balled and glared at the smaller man. So you telling me... Sam C. took all of what I gave you to sell over to the Braxton party thing? Wahoo stared for a moment in abject fear, and then stammered out, y y Yes, he took all that was left, along with our blend. He said he'd call you. Lil Luther nodded. Yeah, he fucking called me. Asked for some fresh pills to sell to those Braxton kids. Said he made $150 just off pills and had a guaranteed $500 salve a Saturday night. And then nothing. Where the fuck is he? Did you two assholes party up my stuff? At that, he edged it a little bit closer 
and the smell of rotten food between his teeth filled Wahoo's nostrils. And Wahoo spread his hands to indicate haplessness and to be ready to fend off the rain of fists he expected at any moment. N no, we didn't party at all. Samsi heard about the party over there and went to sell some favours. Maybe chase a little, white towel deer. I, p uh, I fell asleep waiting for him. He never showed. And then I saw the laws over there Monday evening. That Broxton kid, TJ, walked around with a fat deputy, uh, Briscoe. A little Luther frowned. And then what? And why the fuck the law's looking around? Wahoo tried to call up into himself. I, I, uh, I don't know. I watched, but they walked into the woods. Little Luther produced an evil smile. Well, Wahoo, looks like you and me are going to take a walk in those woods. Little Luther couldn't believe that two jackholes would have tried to stiff him. They never had before, and he was sure they were too scared to start. And then again, Sam C. had been hinting lately that a homegrown blend made enough that they might not need to sell the pills that Luther supplied. Dangerous thinking on Sam C.'s part. He and Wahoo trampled along the muddy trail that led onto the back part of the Broxton place, and they knew that the mum was at work and the kids were at school. So, neither worried about anybody seeing them or saying anything if they did. Nobody messed with Lil Luther King. Yet, he still didn't want to draw unnecessary attention, and so he parked his car just around the next curve in the road from the Broxton's driveway. And they could have easily walked, and Wahoo's trailer was just around the next two curves after that, and on the other side of the road. But Lil Luther liked to drive. He liked to show off his ride to the locals. Wahoo stumbled along behind him and cursed aloud at every trip and stumble. And these were frequent since he hadn't cared for going into the woods since he'd been frightened as a kid. And something about big green eyes that he told his parents. They neither cared nor believed him. And despite his night terrors and return to bedwetting, those just got him more thumps from his father. He had taken his first illicit drugs to be able to sleep. Lil Luther was about to turn around and tell him to be quiet when he realised that he hadn't actually heard the fall for the past few moments. He stopped and looked back. No sign of Wahoo. He called in a low voice. Wahoo! Get your ass over here, fool! No response. Now a little angry, he turned back along the trail. He had just covered he was going to smack that dumbass around a little, maybe knock some sense into him. Had he paid attention, he may have noticed that Wahoo's tracks in the soft wet ground stopped and then headed back towards the road. He didn't need to see them though, he knew that Wahoo had freaked out and fled. In his peripheral vision, he caught a glimpse of a large dark form. What the fuck was his fitting final utterance as he heard a primal scream and felt the sting of large claws grip his arms and shoulders. Before he could scream, the fangs that sank into the back of his neck rotated and snapped his neck. He never managed another inhale of breath. Wahoo tripped and stumbled and fumbled his way back along the trail. He couldn't believe what he'd seen. That cat thing! It had sat out inside the trees and stared at him just stared, and with those ginormous green eyes, then licked its chomps with a big red tongue. He hadn't even thought about warning Lil Luther, he just bolted, like the coward he was. He ran so fast that he hadn't had time to make his normal noises. He heard the predatory scream, intended to momentarily freeze prey and make it vulnerable. Oh, he ran right past Lil Luther's parked car, on down the road to his crappy little trailer house. When he arrived, he locked himself in his room, squatted on the floor next to his bed, and shook and cried. It had to be a bad trip. He lied, of course. He had to have been high. He was always high on something. Oh, those pills. That scream. Surely, little Luther would arrive soon and beat him to a pulp, but at least he won't eat me. He shivered. Wahoo spent a miserable afternoon in his miserable little hovel. TJ was anxious to get home, and Will was coming over, and they were going out on a hunt, and there was something stalking the property. 
Cassie would cover for them if their mother came home early. Not likely, but they'd be ready. As the bus slowed on the last curve in the road before the driveway, he saw a car parked over on the shoulder. Gaudy thing. He'd seen it parked at Wahoo's trailer a few times. And Wahoo was a piece of crap druggie who lived down the road. Reasonably harmless and just trashy. His friend and off times roommate Sam C was a full fledged turd. Weird place to park, he thought. Never know what dope heads were thinking. When they made it home, TJ helped Cassie set up the supper preparation. She was a good hand with a little rifle and had their dad's eye for tracking, but keeping mum unstressed was more important than pride on her skills. Will rolled up about half an hour after the bus had dropped them at the home. He rode in his own dead father's four-wheeler and had a 12-gauge shotgun slung in a long holster on the side of the vehicle. He wore his rubber boots and a floppy hat his dad had left him with the name Billy embroidered on the brim in bright green letters. He treasured the goofy thing because it had belonged to his father, who died alongside his best friend Travis Sr. on Black Cat's Ridge down south. He grinned, something else he'd gotten from his father, a little crooked to one side but sincere. His humour was a good counter for TJ's sometimes taciturn nature. Ready? Looks like we may get some more rain before we get back. We'll eye the slate grey clouds scudding overhead. Maybe if we can get ahead of it, we can find some tracks. TJ just simply nodded and hefted his 308. Take care, Cassie. Hopefully we get done and get back before Mum gets home. If not, we're fishing at the pond, right? Cassie shook her head. Nope. TJ looked at her annoyed. It was a dumb lie, but one they could fake. What? She rolled her eyes. You may need these to be convincing. She reached around the corner inside the house and out of sight of the two boys, who stood in the yard and brought out a pair of fishing poles, which she held up triumphantly. TJ rolled his eyes but thanked her. Will's grin widened and he eagerly thanked her and praised her foresight. TJ rolled his eyes again and they each checked their weapons and then set off towards the pond and forest and fields out back. The two-legged things didn't smell very good. Or at least at first, yet they were starting to grow on him. He was getting old and tangling with feral hogs or chasing deer had become more of a challenge than he liked. The taste was similar to pork, but the outer skins often stank and were inedible. The big one today had been tasty, and the leftovers were now safely stored in the crook of a tree deep inside his territory. He had been taking a nice nap, but in the distance he heard an annoying buzz. One of the things the two-legged creatures rode. The young hunter might return. He didn't feel much like it, but decided to take a stalk around his perimeter. Not hungry, yet he was feeling a little angry and protective. Too many two-legs in his territory in the past few days. The boys first looked around the pond and the blood tree, and there were still a few rusty patches and streaks on the trunk and in the crook where TJ had seen the bloody mess resting, just a little of the stench remained in the air. Even the rain couldn't wash away everything at once, and yet nature would soon take its toll. Once the weather turned, insects would quickly devour and remove the evidence. Will's eyes grew wide when he saw the bloodstains. He'd believed TJ, of course, but seeing human blood from a dead body was novel and a bit unsettling for him. It wasn't the blood itself. He hunted and worked around livestock enough to be inured to the mere sight and smell. It was the knowledge that this blood had once been liquid and had coursed through the veins of another human being. He felt a few goose pimples arise as TJ picked out a pathway that led towards the back of the property. TJ seethed. The deputy should have been out here soon as it stopped raining. If he and his friend could slog through the wet woodland, then so could they. Of course, it was his family's land, and so he didn't mind the hunt. He just wanted to know who the victim had been. Maybe someone with a family, he worried. He couldn't help but think of his own father and Wills, and they'd been killed and eaten by wild creatures. Maybe some kid or kids were sitting at home waiting for their parent to return. They needed to find and stop their own threat from the wild. The trees had stopped dripping, but the overcast sky had grown even darker as the boys reached the back fence line. 
They hadn't really spoken about it, but TJ had taken the lead and had a search pattern in mind. Billy trusted his older friend. He knew just how intelligent TJ was, even if he brooded and grouched at times. The trust between them was solid, and it had been between their fathers. TJ noticed it first, the shadow that paralleled their path. The creature that paced silently along beside their own squelching and noisy steps. I glided from cover to cover, never fully visible, but never fully absent. He looked over his shoulder at Will and said quietly, You see it? Out to the left. Will nodded and kept up the pace. Both boys considered alternatives. If they stopped, the beast might attack or simply disappear once more. Or if they ran or quickly changed direction, it might attack, or they might lose sight of it and then it might attack. TJ slowed to walk beside his friend. Oh, let's just get the guns ready, and when I give the signal, we turn and fire at the best target. I know that goes against hunting safety rules, but it's hunting us as much as we're hunting it. Once we fire, we advance together towards the target, like a dad's taurus. He intended the last of his statement to hearten the younger Will, and it worked. TJ moved out ahead again, and then obviously clicked off his safety as a signal. Will did the same, and both of them turned in unison and raised their weapons to where the threat had been. It wasn't there. The shadowy figure had disappeared altogether. After a few heart-pounding moments of waiting, each lowered his barrel and they turned towards one another. TJ spoke in his normal tone. Maybe it knows what guns can do. He didn't finish. A large black and grey streak of fur engulfed him as a thunderous roar sounded and the hunter and prey tumbled across the forest floor. Indistinguishable from one another, Will stood motionless for just a moment and then the panic seized him. He aimed his weapon at the massive cat that was mauling his best friend and fired. The buckshot tore into the flank of the beast and it screamed in its higher pitched tone. It leapt into the air and turned on him as he attempted to load his next round into the pumped shotgun. He instinctively pulled back the firearm as a defensive weapon, taking it from the firearm to a club. He felt himself rise into the air, hovering on his side for a moment, as though he had rested on an invisible couch. And then he quickly hit the ground and felt the burning scratches along his lower left leg. The big cat had swatted him as it ran past, and he now lay on the forest floor in shock and pain. He heard the sharp bark of TJ's rifle and stayed in place, stayed low as his friend angrily rose and stalked in the wake of the enormous feline, all the while pumping rounds after the monster in vain attempt to follow his plan and take out the beast. He bled from a tooth mark on his forehead and from several other wounds about his body. And he was clearly bruised and battered, but he was also furious. Will was almost afraid of his best friend in that moment, of the boy who'd rescued him from Bully's hand. Oh crap! At least two of the wounds on TJ's side appeared to be from Buckshot. I shot TJ! He wowed in his mind, and then the pain in his leg truly set in, and he realised that it was more than a superficial scratch. TJ picked up his groaning body in the firefighter's carry. Will would have to keep hold of his shotgun on his own, and TJ would need every ounce of strength just to carry and balance him. He gripped his own rifle, now depleted of ammunition and therefore nearly useless in both hands, and trudged along the trail at the best speed he could. He kept looking around as best he could in case the big cat returned to finish them. Apparently Will had done some damage with the shotgun, but now that he'd started to calm, and the first rush of adrenaline had started to burn off, he started to feel the effects of his own wounds. And somehow, the cat hadn't completely shredded him. He'd gotten his rifle up and between the teeth, and Will had acted pretty quickly. And still, it had hit him hard, and its claws had raked him. He'd need a new rain slicker, and naturally, it started to rain as they reached the pond. Terry Ann was furious with them both, but worried and terrified at the same time. So much for keeping her stress low, TJ thought. She'd been home when they arrived. TJ exhausted and bleeding, Will bleeding and unable to stand. It had almost been too much for her, but she gathered them up, and Cassie helped them as they piled into the truck and drove to the small city and its pretty decent university hospital. 
She'd had to call Will's mother on the way, and they met at the emergency room and clung to one another while their sons were patched up. Will had two younger siblings, and his mother, Cheryl, was even more frazzled than Terry Ann. They were barely making it, and now he'd gone and had his knee all but destroyed. It would take multiple surgeries to repair it, and she had no idea how they would pay for it. She sat on a small sofa near Will's bed while her two younger children slept, a little head on each of her legs. Terry Ann and Cassie sat on the sofa on the opposite wall near TJ's bed, the same room for convenience. Among other things, they both needed to speak with the state game warden about what had attacked them. And Terry Ann rose and let Cassie stretch out on the sofa. She padded across the too cold room and took a seat in the chair next to Cheryl. They'd been friends along with their husbands and kids, but they hadn't seen one another as often since the men had been killed. And there just wasn't time. They got an insurance funds and go fund me money, but with maintaining homes and raising children, things were often tight financially. And this latest incident had them both on edge. So, you think it'd take four or more surgeries to fix him? Terry Ann spoke softly to avoid disturbing the children. Cheryl simply nodded and held back tears. The boys said it was a big black cat, and they decided to take it on like their dad's. Terry Ann trailed off in her own attempt to hold back screams of pain and fear and anger that wanted to burst from her tortured mind and soul. She'd called the new family members, now her phone buzzed to alert her to the new text. She rolled her eyes and Cheryl looked at her questioningly. Uncle Jim says he's on the way and will go. Stand guard at the house. I might as well. Hard-headed Broxton men. TJ watched in horror as once again the luminous green eyes grew to enormous proportions and the giant black beast swatted him back and forth between its paws. The claws that looked like long curved swords that dug into his sides with each swat and with each transit between the paws he spun dizzily. And then the cat rose and swallowed him whole. His view switched to the front porch of his home and there was Will seated in a wheelchair, his legs missing and his face and body scarred and torn. His wounds began to weep blood, and he looked at TJ accusingly as the weeping turned to torrents. Uncle Jim made a call once he'd packed, loaded his pickup, and got an underway. Edwina, this is your father. Oh, I'm all right, sweetness, but there's been an incident with your cousin, well, second cousin, Travis Jr., the one they call TJ, some kind of big cat, Maybe the cryptid type that's haunted the backwoods for centuries. Probably a good idea to send at least an exploratory crew. I don't get around the woods as well as I used to. The boys claim that they hit it with buckshot. Likely just pissed it off. I'm sorry. I know you don't like that word, sunshine. Anyway, I'm headed that way. Kick it around and please let me know. Love you too, Blossom. He drove on into the darkness, anxious to get to the old homestead and protect his kin. So, you knew that there could be a predator out in those woods and you didn't tell anyone? You just made patrol notes? Sheriff Troy Green had not raised his voice, but Deputy Briscoe knew that he was in for it. If he lied and got caught, he'd be fired immediately. If he told the truth, well, he'd take a hit, likely a suspension without pay. Well, sir, I didn't really believe the kid. Well, there was some blood in the tree, but I thought he was probably just imagining things and... It was from some animal, and there was no sign of a body. And then it rained, and, well, after that I just forgot. There were no more reports, and I didn't think the tech could get much after the rain, so... He trailed off weakly, fitting since the response was weak. The sheriff sighed. <sighs> TJ emailed me the photos he took on his phone. Barney Fife could have seen that, and he was telling the truth. We'll deal with it after the crisis is resolved. We need all hands on deck for the moment, even yours. First thing is to secure the area around the attack, and we need to notify all the residents in the area to be on the lookout for a large predator, possibly even an escaped big cat. We already have people working on finding out whether anyone is missing such a beast, and we have some experts from Parks and Wildlife on the way. I truly don't have time for this, Briscoe. You have no idea how thin your ice is. Get with Sergeant Norris, and she's on notification detail. They need to take it seriously. T. 
TJ was young enough to cry openly and sincerely. Will, I'm so sorry. I got you into this. It's so bad. I don't know what to do. You are a hero, though. You saved my life. Will looked up, bleary-eyed with pain medication and other fluids being pumped into his body. Yeah, but I shot you too. TJ suppressed the absurd laughter that rose through his tears. Only a couple of pellets, and those were outside the ribs. Hurts, but they'll make cool scars along with that claw marks. You mainly hit that son of a bitch, though. He leaned closer and whispered. Now it's my turn. I'm pretty sure I missed with a rifle. I was too shaken and pissed to shoot straight. They won't let me join the hunt, but they can't stop me from following it. He rose and winked at his friend. And please, get better, and I'll make sure to do some overtime if... Uh, when I get a job, to help your mum. Will managed one of his famous grins and shook his friend's hand. You know, you say me right back. I couldn't have made it out on my own. Take care of it, and uh, take care, TJ. Uncle Jim stood from the rocking chair on the front porch and set aside his shotgun as the pickup came to a stop. Cassie leapt out of the passenger side and looked back and forth confused. She wanted to run to her great uncle, but she needed to help TJ. And she settled for, Hi, Uncle Jim. Thank you for coming. In the end, TJ helped himself. He moved a little gingerly, but he was young and athletic, and so he managed and waved for Cassie to go. Terry Ann lingered to see that TJ made it, but had already learned that he wanted to get on there by himself and not have his mother hovering over him, just like his father. She thought, as fresh tears threatened to well up and trickle down her cheek, tears of love and pride. She watched as the young man climbed the stairs and greeted his great uncle with a handshake and man hug. She winced along with him, though Uncle Jim was clearly careful to avoid the bandages as much as possible. I told you young'uns, just holler if you needed anything, the old man admonished the youngsters. TJ smiled a little. Well, I hollered when that big booger cat hit me. And Cassie assured the septagonarian. I would have called Uncle Jim, but in the rush I left my phone here at the house. And with that, she registered a horrified face. She hadn't been able to chat with her friends. With Natalie, she ran into the house without another word. You two sit out here and visit. I'll get supper started, Terry Ann told her. Well, she had to think sooner or later about her boy and the men. And TJ, don't stretch the truth. Cool wounds and scars tell their own tale. And with that, she entered their home, glad to have a task in her mind to keep her busy and to avoid her rushing thoughts. TJ took the porch swing while Uncle Jim resumed his seat in the old rocking chair. So, you met old green eyes. Uncle Jim half asked and half stated. TJ nodded. I didn't know if it had a name. So you already knew about that thing? You didn't think it might be important to warn us? Uncle Jim shrugged. Nothing to warn about. You likely met a descendant of old Green Eyes. New Green Eyes, if you will. We killed the other one, your grandpa and me. First real predator I ever faced. Huh, <laughs> wasn't the last. My point is... No one has seen one around here since we killed that one, over 50 years ago. And it took to eating cattle and Pa was afraid it would take to eating young'uns. TJ relaxed. I'm sorry, Uncle Jim. I didn't mean to snap, it's just... Jim nodded in turn. It's tough, TJ. You went up against a big cat and fought it to a draw. Your friend is hurt and you blame yourself. Rightfully so, at least in part. Caused plenty of problems for others as well. And with that end, well, losing your dad last year and being worried about finding work, it's a lot to ask for someone of your age, at least these days. Plus, I'm sure the pain is a little distracting. Anything new on Will? What's his prognosis? He altered the subject to give the kid at least a little break. He's going to need multiple surgeries, and even after that, Will will have a limp for the rest of his life. I don't know how his mum will be able to pay for it. Her insurance is crappy, and so is her job. And there are three kids. I'm going to give her at least half my paycheck. The other half has to go to mum. I'll just put school on hold. He paused. That should be the last thing on my mind. I bet there's all sorts of thoughts and ideas and plans running around in your brain at the moment, Uncle Jim said with understanding. 
Never know what thoughts will intrude under stress. He looked up as an official-looking SUV approached. Took them a while to get started, but here comes the warning. The experts will be here shortly, and then the hunting party. Won't that be fun? TJ had never asked what Uncle Jim had done for a living. The stories were variants and myriad among the family, and he thought that it must have been something interesting, since he was exactly right on the list and order of official visitations. The young one issued a low, triumphant growl and partially closed his eyes in satisfaction. The old beast was dead. The one that had beaten him in his territorial challenge last year. He lay there frozen in rigor mortis. The young hunters had indeed found their marks, and yet the old one managed to mark it to its favorite sleeping tree, at least to the foot of it. The younger animal cast about but did not like this place. It smelled too much of the two-legged creatures in which he had no interest, unless they came his way for a fight. He'd fleshed out in the past year and had come here to make a new challenge. The old one had made it easy. Wahoo was hungry, almost as bad as when he'd been a kid and under punishment. He was long out of other drugs, and so he sparked the last of his special blend on hand. Now he had a serious munchies, yet he was afraid to go outside. There had been some stale crackers in one of the cabinets, nothing in the fridge but some beer and rancid butter. He was miserable and worried for Sam C. He was glad that little Luther hadn't returned. Asshole. Hope that green-eyed monster with a red tongue got him, he thought resentfully. He hadn't eaten enough to crap his pants, but he expelled gas in a loud fart when there was a sudden pounding at his door. Oh shit, Lil Luf is back. He's pissed, he's gonna... Raced through his mind until it registered what his visitor was actually saying. Sheriff's office, Deputy Briscoe. Come on, Wahoo, Sam C. One of you must be here. Wahoo made his way to his feet and stumbled over to the door. He opened it a crack and peeked out into the bright midday light. Uh, um, hey officer, can I like help you man? He sputtered out in confusion and redoubled fear. Fat Briscoe, as the locals called him, stood at a crack of the open door. Ah, uh, don't worry, you ain't in no trouble. There was an animal attack just down the road. We're letting everybody know to stay inside until we can catch or kill the thing. While who considered what he'd heard, his thoughts moved at high pace and so the deputy was almost to his car before Wahoo was able to come to a conclusion. The Jow had food. He stepped out and waved at the deputy, retreating back. Uh, hey, like, uh, officer, I mean, deputy. And Briscoe barely heard the tremulous voice behind him, but he had to turn to get back into his car, and so he saw Wahoo out in the yard, vaguely waving and saying something. What is it, Wahoo? Wahoo stopped, unsure of what to say. He desperately wanted the deputy to take him to jail. That was over 30 miles from here. Maybe he'd be safe from those glowing green eyes. Um, uh, uh, it's like Sam C and another guy, uh, um, Luther. They, like, went into the woods over, like, by the Broxton place. I haven't seen them since. Sheriff Green, Sergeant Norris, and two officials from the Parks and Wildlife Department crowded onto the porch to hear TJ tell his story firsthand. Uncle Jim remained, still seated firmly in his rocking chair. Let the youngsters do the standing, he cackled to himself. Sheriff Green spoke to TJ. Mr. Broxton, it looks like you and your friend Will barely escaped alive. Would you be up to showing us where you found the body and then where you were attacked? We'll have a strong, well-armed party to protect you and our tracker and his dogs. At this, he indicated a man who stood over by a pickup with a trio of leashed hounds. We'll be on hand to find the animal that attacked you. You are absolutely certain what you saw? TJ nodded. Yes, sir. It was a cat, no doubt. It had to be around nine feet long. I sure felt like it. Thing weighed a ton. At this, he grasped at his ribs. Are you sure you'll be able to do this? The sheriff asked doubtfully. TJ nodded again. Yes, sir. Will was laid up in hospital because I took him out into the woods. 
I owe him my life and I'm just sore. The ribs are bruised and, well, cracked, but not really broken. Everything else is bandaged tight. I really need to help with this. To tell the truth, I plan on going back out behind your group no matter what you said. I want to take that killer. I have a family to protect and revenge to get. I know it's not personal with animals, but Will was unlikely to walk right for the rest of his life. He'll always have some pain. I don't know why this thing came to us, but I want to help put a stop to it. Sheriff Green offered him a tight smile. Ah, good enough. We'll be moving slowly at first anyway, and from what you told us, it's not too far. Uh, by the way, you can take that big knife on your belt, but no rifle this time. The rest of the party will take care of that. The game warden and the large animal removal specialist had remained relatively silent, but the expert now spoke his piece. This may be an old cat, one that can't hunt anymore. It could also be escaped and not afraid of humans. No zoos or listed shelters have reported a missing black panthera genus, but sometimes private owners lose interest in them as pets or lose control and don't report it. Too many illegal owners. They wrapped up the planning session and took off towards the pond. Cassie sat on the front porch with Uncle Jim, each with a firearm across the knees, ready to guard the homestead. And Jim was proud of the young'uns. Travis Sr. and Terry Ann had raised them well. TJ pointed out the blood tree, and the tracker took his hounds around it. They took off down the game trail, and shortly, inside of a strand of brush, they found some shreds of clothing and a gnawed human skull. The sheriff approached the pile, and the expert in tow. The fussy man squatted near the corpse and examined it closely, despite the odour. Definitely Pantera, but I've never seen anything quite like it. it. Looks like a panther or jaguar on first examination, but but the radius indicates something larger, like a tiger. Sheriff Green squatted next to him and reached for a section of the pants. It included a back pocket and, miraculously, a wallet. An even greater miracle, the wallet contained an ID card. The sheriff stood quickly and used his phone to call the dispatch centre. After greeting the dispatcher, he asked, Have there been any new missing person reports today? The lead dispatcher took over the call. Funny you should ask, boss. I was about to call you with this one. Deputy Briscoe called about a young man from a location just down the road from where you are, a little over half a mile. Wahoo reported that his friend Sam Clinton a.k.a. Sam C. and a man named Luther King. Uh, they're both missing. I can preliminary confirm that we found one of them. There is an old school ID with that name, Samuel Clinton. Keep that under wraps until we confirm and notify next of kin. If Briscoe is on hand, please have him report to the Broxton residence and wait for us. The sheriff wrapped up the call and the tracker led off with the dogs once more. And TJ had pointed towards where he and Will had been attacked. The tracker wanted the dogs to try and pick up the scent on their own. If the cat was still up and moving, they'll find it. Worst case, there'd still be plenty of scent trace left at the scene of the attack, but maybe even some blood. Before the party got moving again, a shot rang from within the group and everyone jumped and ready their various weapons. Each hunter looked around quickly to discover the source of the gunfire. And Sergeant Norris raised her face and then quickly looked towards Sheriff Green. That was me. She pointed at the ground with the still hot muzzle of her AR. And there lay the writhing corpse of a large copperhead. The reptile had been coiled and prepared to strike the large animal expert as he knelt to tie his shoe. And Sheriff Green nodded. Good shot, Sarge. Now, everybody breathe. In short order, the tracker moved out ahead to the attack scene. The hounds didn't need to circle, they immediately picked up on the scent of the killer and bayed in excitement. They led the hunting party, each of whom held a weapon at the ready, to the base of a large hardwood tree. And there, stretched out before them, was the carcass of a huge cat, stiff with its once baleful eyes torn from its head by scavengers. Its tongue protruded from one side of its mouth and flies swarmed all around it. It was indeed just over eight feet in length and quite heavy and some of the hairs around its muzzle had gone white. The expert advised, It was definitely an old cat, definitely Pantera genus, but otherwise unfamiliar. He placed a rag from his pocket over his mouth and nose and bent to look more closely. 
He looked up at TJ. Well, young man, looks like the animal was hit in the ribs with shotgun pellets, but at least one large caliber rifle round entered his torso. He pointed. Here. That was the kill shot. Not immediate, but likely didn't suffer for long. In the meantime, Sergeant Norris, keen eyes had spotted more human remains in the main fork of the tree. TJ was soon free to return home for some much needed rest while the others remained and processed the scene. The tracker was no longer needed, and so he and the hounds escorted a young man home. When they arrived, Fat Briscoe was seated on the porch in a folding chair and talking with Uncle Jim. A scraggly figure sat on another folder next to him and chewed hungrily on the last few bites of a sandwich. Two girls sat on the porch swing, his sister, gun across her knees, and Natalie, Disney princess eyes glowing with admiration. TJ awakened from a troubled sleep. He had taken some pills for the pain in his ribs and had fallen asleep on the couch in the living room. His sister had been sprawled back on the same piece of furniture down near his feet. Her head was now forward and her eyes were open and alert. Natalie had been curled up on the recliner and now sat up and looked around in confusion and with a hint of fear. They heard voices out on the porch and then in the distance they heard again what awakened them. The call of a big Pantera genus cat on the hunt. Wow, 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 meow, wow. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant stuff, wonderful writing there once again from the awesome Michael G. Lockhart. Thank you ever so much, brother, for the heads up on that one and the first dibs. Very, very much appreciated. And I'm sure our subscribers and listeners appreciate that too. As ever, guys and girls, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? Of course, if you have a story to share with us on the show, please do get it over to my email, which is dmtforestoffear at gmail.com. And I look forward to hearing from you. As always, guys, I hope you're all holding up well in this stir crazy times and trying to keep fit and healthy as possible. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>